All right, guys, we are in Matthew chapter 6. Do y'all know why we're in Matthew chapter 6? Because it comes after Matthew chapter 5, and so that's why we are, all right? And so with that, if you go to Matthew 5 and look over, there's Matthew 6, and that's where we're going to be. So in verse 1 is where it's starting out this morning. And Jesus says, Take heed that you do not do your charitable, charitable deeds before men. To be seen by them. Otherwise, you have no reward from your Father in heaven. Therefore, when you do a charitable deed, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory from men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But when you do a charitable deed, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, that your charitable deed may be in secret. And your father who sees in secret will himself reward you openly. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But you, when you pray, go into your room. And when you shut the door, pray to your father who is in the secret place. And your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. And when you pray, don't use vain repetitions as the heathens do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Therefore, don't be like them, for your Father knows the things that you need before you ask of Him. In this manner, therefore, pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Father, we thank you, uh, Lord, that it's always ready, it's always willing, and it's always able, Father, to instruct us in your righteousness and to convict us of our errors. Father, we pray that you would give us the courage and boldness to repent. And Father, that you, Lord, you would give us the encouragement to follow and to lead in your shadow, Father, to do your works, to speak your words, Father, to live our lives in you. Father, in all things that we say and all things that we do, Father, we hope to just encourage and bless, but Father, more than anything, to glorify you. Lord, we thank you, we praise you, and we love you, and we ask this because of your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, so we are still in the Sermon on the Mount. So you say, well, you know, Jonathan, I can read the Sermon on the Mount in about, you know, eight minutes, and it has taken you four Sundays now to only get about halfway through it, all right? Uh, Jesus was a much better preacher than I am, and, and so it takes a lot less for him than it does for me. And so as we expound on it, remember that here he's talking to his disciples, and he's instructing them not a salvation message, but rather he's instructing them in sanctification. He's instructing them on what it looks like to be a follower of Christ. And we've gone through many different things. And as he lists out the righteousness and the right works and the relationship with the law, and we've looked at many different things, he finally he comes down to this portion after saying, unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, there's no way you're getting to heaven. And then he starts to break it down. Now today we pick up in chapter 6 in the middle of his sermon where he starts to talk about charitable deeds. And he says, take heed that you do not do your charitable deeds before men to be seen by them. He says, otherwise you have no reward from your Father in heaven. Therefore, when you do your charitable deed, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have the glory from men. He says, assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. Now, 
he introduces us now. We saw last sermon uh, where he all of a sudden, like he really throws tax collectors under under the the bus. And he's like, you know, uh, even the tax collectors like the people who like them. Um, So don't be like those guys. You know, you're supposed to love the people who are different from you. And then he comes into, into this portion and he introduces us to the hypocrites all under the guise of talking about the righteousness of the Pharisees. So now let's talk about the Pharisees again. Now the Pharisees, um, very often we want to characterize the Pharisees on these, you know, like stiff and stern kind of guys, no fun crowd, but they were actually more in line with today what I would call the charismatics. You know, they were much more trying to over-spiritualize everything. And so everything had to be overly spiritualized and over overly hashed, and, and they were extreme on what they wanted to include into the Word and into the will of God instead of really being, you know, fuddy-duddies on this is what God says and let's not go past what God says. They wanted to go way past what God said into what they thought, what they felt, what they wanted. You know, that was our Pharisees where they wanted to create their own religion on top of God's religion um, for them to follow so that they would be extra super duper, extra spiritual, whoopsie daisy kind of people, all right? So that's what their whole goal was. And So they had their own list of rules, their own set of righteousness, their own everything that uh, that they set up for themselves. Now here, as he's talking about the hypocrite, he says that hypocrites do charitable works. But the reason why they do charitable works is completely different than what the Christian is called to do charitable works. So there is a call, there is a a vantage point here where he says there will be charitable works. And charitable works are to be done by the Christian. They are to be part of our life, that we are very charitable, that we do good things, that we bless others, that we help those that are around us, that we do all of this for what reason? For the glory of God and for the glory of God alone. That's it. We don't do it so people think we're a good person. We don't do it so that we can get accolades. We don't do it for the attention. We don't do it for any of those reasons. The only, the sole, the exclusive motivation of good works in the Christian life is for the glory of God so that much can be made of him and that he can be lifted up, that he can be made much of, that he can be bragged upon, not about us, because he then turns it and he says, there is the hypocrite, and the hypocrite does good works, but when the hypocrite does good works, the hypocrite says, all right, everybody, I'm about to do a good work, blow the trumpet. I need everybody's attention. If everybody would look at me, then let me describe the good work of which I'm about to do or have done or will do in the future. Everybody, I need your attention. Everybody look, look, all right, do 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 that was my best trumpet. I don't know. I don't know what a trumpet sounds like. And so I should have got Luke. I, and Luke is a trumpet player. I should have brought him in. But with that, um, you know, that was the whole thing of calling the attention. Everybody look because everybody see this good thing that I've done or that I'm about to do. He says, for that guy, that guy is saying, I mean, first of all, could you imagine? Could you imagine that? Could you imagine if we, you know, all of a sudden we're like, okay, everybody, attention to the stage as we now talk about our goodness. You'd go, this is crazy. That has no place. That doesn't belong. That's out of hand. That, 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 that is just wrong. Now, there was uh, some years back, I got to go with a, a church to a missions uh, outreach uh, to help this church plant up above Birmingham, and, and this church that we went to, it was massive. I mean, that was it, the sanctuary probably sat 1,500, maybe 2,000. Uh, like, they had their own gymnasium. They had classrooms all through. Their small chapel was bigger than our sanctuary. All right, they just had reserved for, like, Bible studies and wedding events or, like, if they had two events scheduled at the same time. They had a chapel that's bigger than our sanctuary, which was their extra chapel. I heard that somewhere in the church there was an indoor swimming pool. I didn't get to find that, all right, because it was too big. It was massive. This thing was ginormous. 
And as the, the pastor was showing us around the facilities the first day, we, we turn a hallway and he flips on a light and a few of the lights come on. The rest were blown or had, had aged out. Something was wrong with them. And he goes, all right, now as, as you walk, you're, you're going to have to be, pay attention to the cobwebs. I said, cobwebs? What in the world, you know? And, but as we walk those hallways, sure enough, man, you're having to, you know, every time you go through a door, you're having to wipe out cobwebs and all. And I said, when's the last time anybody's used this? And he said, ah, oh, it's been, you know, probably 10, 15 years. And I said, well, what is this? What, what is this hallway? He said, well, this was Sunday school. This, this is where Sunday school classes were. We haven't used this in a while. I said, oh, Wow. And we turn another corner and another corner and another corner. This thing was like a maze. This was a massive, big-time, downtown Birmingham church. And then we turn a hallway, and there's all of these pictures all along the hallway, just as on both sides all the way down. And it's picture after picture after picture after picture after picture. There had to be 50 or 60 of them. And I said, what, what are all, who are all these guys? And they said, oh, well, those are all the, the former pastors. And we started to look, and it was, they'd been there for a year, two years, three years. Like, man, they were, they were good at churning, churning through pastors. And he said, oh, well, goodness, you know. And, and then everywhere we turned, what we started seeing, what really started to catch my eye was everywhere that we went, there were little placards. There were always these little placards everywhere. And they were on windows. They were on the pews. They were on every piece of furniture. They were on lecterns. They were everywhere. The, the funniest one, because like I was sending Lindsay pictures as I was saying, I was like, this is crazy. Like somewhere, like somebody in the church had a placard business and they were getting filthy off of it. I mean, like, you know, they were making tons of money selling placards to people. But the funniest one was I found one on a music stand. Those things are like 20 bucks. And they did a $20 music stand and then probably put a $10 placard on the music stand. The church was full of look at me. The church was full of look at us. The church was full of, of everybody look at this glory. And so in that, this massive sanctuary that sat an easy 2,000 people. Do you know how many people were there that Sunday for church? Twelve. because that kind of spirit kills things that look at me I've got to you know put this let's memorialize this and when things start to be done for the glory of self versus the glory of God it chokes it strangles it kills because it quits becoming a church of Jesus Christ and it starts becoming a church of us so here he says, don't be like the hypocrite, because the hypocrite will come to church. Don't be like the hypocrite, because the hypocrite will do good works. But when the hypocrite comes to church, and when the hypocrite does good works, the hypocrite goes, where's my trumpet? Everybody look, everybody sound, everybody pay attention to what's happening up front. And there he says, they've received their reward because they did it in front of men, because they really were wanting the reward from men. What was hypocritical about the hypocrite was that while he said that it was all about God, it was really all about him. And while he said this was to bless the Lord, in reality it was to bless himself. And so as a massive critical error, it absolutely poisons things and it turns it from ministry to attention and it turns it from the family of God to a selfish pursuit and it turns what would be a glorious God-honoring act into a show into a trumpet concert then he moves on and he continues in this in this vein of talking about this new character that's been introduced this new hypocrite character and he says all right, we've already talked about when you do good. Now let's talk about when you pray. And he says, when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrite, the actor, 
the playwright, the one wearing a mask, the one putting on a show. He says, because they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corner of the streets that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But you, when you pray, go into your room. When you shut your door, you pray to the Father who is in the secret place, and your Father who sees in secret will reward openly. So he says that, that even in prayer life, you know, something, this communion with God, this, this attitude of communication back and forth of giving to the Father and receiving from the Father, that, that even the hypocrite plays along with that too. But the hypocrite's prayer isn't so much for God as it is for himself. And so when he prays, he prays for those who are around him. He prays for the attention. He prays for the accolade. He prays for the attention. He, he prays to get the honor. He prays for people to, to clap and applaud his prayer of what a good prayer he just prayed. He's such a good prayer of prayers. And, and that we just absolutely adore to hear him pray because he's going to put on a show when he prays. Jesus begins to talk about the motive of prayer. That here, the hypocrite, his motive in prayer isn't to honor God or glorify God or beseech God or go towards God. His motive in prayer is actually for attention. What can I say? What can I do? How can I get an accolade? How can I get a back slap? How can somebody tell me thank you for that prayer that I just prayed? And he says that when they pray, they love to pray standing up, not humbled, not face to the ground, not prostrate before the Lord, but rather in a very dignified position. I'm here in the sanctuary. I don't know if y'all just heard my trumpet concert, but now it is time for my auditory concert, my oratory concert. So now, everybody, if you'd bow your head and close your eyes and listen to this masterpiece I've perfected. Dear Lord, see how their voice changes? You ever heard somebody who their prayer voice didn't match up to their talking voice? You know, and you, you meet them and you're just talking to them and they're like, hey, buddy, how you doing? You know, man, you know, they're just, you know, they're just like country mouse, you know, and hey, guys, how you doing? And they're like, all right, time to pray. <clears throat> Dear Lord, thou art Lord. Yeah. And it changes. Now, why'd they change? You don't think God heard them when they were all squeaky mouse? You know, like, like God still hears that. Well, what's the performance? What's the, what's the effort to try to sound professional and respectable? And I start to use $6 words when I talk to thou holiest of holies. Why do we do that? Do you think God's like, I just can't listen to the heart of that old country bumpkin? If only he knew the king's English. If only he could throw some words in there. If only he could impress me. If only if he, if he would subscribe to like the dictionary app where it gives you a word for the day. Y'all ever have that? You used to have those calendars and be a word, new word for every day. Then you have some, somebody who like uses a word that's way above their pay grade and it's out of order. You know, and like it just does not fit. Why do we feel like we got to do that with our prayer life? You see, because when we pray, if we care what anybody around us hears, then who are we actually praying for? Yeah, we're praying for the glory of us. We're not praying for the glory of God. And so our prayer life, our motive should be to honor God, to glorify God, to do everything to his glory. And he says that we, it's not that we stand up for the attention. It's not that we draw attention to ourselves. It's not that our motive is a performance and man, our voice, and we try to impress or we preach in our prayers or, or anything, but rather that man, we just talk to God. He said, you know what? Even the heathens have a prayer life. The hypocrite has a prayer life, but also the heathen has a prayer life. And he said that the heathen prayer life is a lot of words and vain repetition. It's just selfish repeating over and over and over and over and over and over again. And so it's not a heartfelt prayer, but rather it's a, formula, it's a formula that they're using. It is this standard prayer of which they're going to pray every time. They've memorized it. It's not coming from the heart, it's coming from the head. Now, how many of you learned this? 
God is great. God is good. Let us thank him for our food. By his hand we are fed. Now be quiet and go to bed. Is that, is that, that's how we say it in our house. All right, all right. But, but, no, you know, but like we learned that, all right? We learned that formulaic prayer. And, and so we repeat it and we repeat it and we repeat it and we repeat it. And while we may mean parts of it, is it really as glorifying if we just say, God, you're great. And God, everything that you do is wonderful and perfect. And Father, I thank you for this daily bread. I thank you, Lord, that you are always delivering, that you're always sustaining. And Father, I just want to glorify you. Thank you, Lord, for that. Now, which is more heartfelt? God is great. God is good. Let us thank for it. Yeah. Oh, but how about this? What if we get really, really biblical with it and we go, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Because he already gave us a method, or he gave us a motive. Now Jesus turns and he gives us a method. But what he didn't give us was a prayer to be vainly repeated. So he turns and now he's going to teach them how to pray. Now, praying was already something that they knew to do. The heathen prayed, the the hypocrite prayed, but now Jesus is going to teach his disciples how to pray. And first off, he started out and he said, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. So it signifies that God is not just a God that we, that we give honor, we give tribute to. He's not just somebody that we try to satiate, that we try to please so that he will please give us some stuff, that we don't go to him as that. He's not a piggy bank Jesus. He, he's not Santa Jesus that we just go to and say, Lord, if you could meet my wish list, if you could do these things for me, but rather that we go to God and our impulse is to go to him as a father. As a father. Now, if we go home and, you know, my kids ask for stuff all the time. Do your kids ask for stuff all the time? Mine do all the time. And you know how they do not get what they want? If they walk in and go, Father, giver of all things, if thou wouldst bless me with this. You know, that's not the way to get it. Now, how do you kids... How do, you get, how do your kids get stuff from you? Dad, you're wonderful. Yeah, that's right. Dad, you're the best. Dad, you're so great. You know what would be great, Dad, if we could just spend some time together and, like, watch a movie, maybe eat some ice cream. Wouldn't that be wonderful, Dad? Oh, geez. And then they go, oh. Because it's about the fellowship. It's about personal things. It's, I want to spend time with you. I want to adore you. I want, I, want to, I want this communion between the two of us. And you go, oh, okay. So it's first, it's we approach him as a father. But then it says, hallowed be thy name. He's a father, but he's also sacred. He is our sacred father. So while we approach him with that warmth and with that love, with that admiration, with that praiseful attitude, we also come with reverence. Because how many of y'all have had your kids ask you for something with the wrong attitude? Yeah, they didn't get that, did they? They'd be like, well, uh, you just circle right back around. You can come back and ask me later. I don't like your attitude. I'm saying no to your attitude. I don't even care what you have to ask for. You just said, Dad, I got bit by a snake and I need poison now. I'd be like, not with that attitude. You know, where's that snake? Let me give him a high five. You know, not, you know, but I'd have bit you too. You know, but, the, uh, but you know, that's our whole attitude that we go towards God is a sacredness, a hallowed of his name, an appreciation. So there's a warmth, but there's also an appreciation. Now in verse 10, he's going to start a series of threes. He's going to pray for three things, and then he's going to pray for three things while he's waiting for the three things. So the first thing that he goes to God with, the first, the first thing that he says is, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's the point. 
thy will be done, thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. So there is this attitude of, Father, I want everything in, in earth, I want everything on this planet, I want everything in this life to be honor and glorifying to you. I want it to be done your way. I want it to be done for your purposes. I want it to be done for your glory. Father, thy will be done, not my will, your will. Father, you let me know your will, and I want to do it that way. But then also, your kingdom, your authority, your domain of the king come on earth just like it is in heaven. So, what on earth do we think should be outside the scope and range of what God has said about it? What on earth do we say, you know what, that's more of an us thing, God. Like, thank you for your opinion, but like, you know, when we get to heaven, we'll try to do it that way. But while we're here, you don't understand. We're in a lost world, and you gave us a perfect word to follow. So um, until perfect comes, we're just going to do it our way. And we took a vote, and the vote said... Um, that we can murder our children. We took a vote, and we just think we can break up families however we want to. We, we took a vote, and we just think that this is the way we should live, and this is how we should act. These are our values, and, and man, you know, sexual perversion is fine with us, and all of this mess and filth, we're okay with it. But, but now, when we get to heaven, we know it'll be perfect. But you know what? We're not even going to try to make it perfect now. What would we think if like, we tried to disciple all the nations? What if, we, what if we wanted our homes to be Christian homes that honor and glorified God to their fullest extent? And then what if we got enough homes together that all were honoring and glorifying God to their fullest extent? And then we had a community that honored and glorified God to its fullest extent. And then if what a couple communities got together, and then it was a whole city that honored and glorified God to its fullest extent. And then we got a couple cities together, and then that was like a county that honored and glorified God to its fullest extent. And then a couple counties get together and we call it a state and we have a state that now is honoring and glorifying God to its fullest extent and then we get a few states together and we have a country that's honoring and glorifying God to its fullest extent and then we have a couple of countries that get together and we have a continent that is honoring and glorifying God to its fullest extent and then we get like all the continents together honoring and glorifying God to its fullest extent and we have a Christian world is that not the is that, is that not the point is that not the mission that God has given us? I think it's so funny when they want to demean Christians who want to follow the, the, the gospel call. They want to follow the great commission. And they want to see a Christian nation, and they call us Christian nationalists. Oh, fear. Oh, my. You mean a loving, giving, concerned nation that wants to honor and glorify God? Oh, no. Please save me from that. But what's really funny is when they call us that, we're not Christian nationalists, we're Christian globalists. Because we want the whole globe to be saved. We want everybody in the world to come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ and honor him with their lives. And when we do that, better watch out, Martians, we're coming for you. Then we'll be Christian, some word with galaxy in it, Galaticians. Is that a word? It is now because I said it, okay? And so, you know, that, that's our whole point is that we want to honor and glorify God. We want his will to be done on earth as it is in heaven because guess what? In heaven, what he says goes. And when somebody didn't want to do that, he made them come down here and he put Adam in charge of them. And then when Adam rebelled, then he sent us another Adam to redeem it. And perfection is coming. And the reclamation is coming. And the garden is coming. And the new heaven is coming. And the new earth is coming. And the new Jerusalem is coming. And guess what? Only those who can with a heartfelt uh, prayer say, Father, who art in heaven, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, will enter into it. We'll be there for it. So he says, that's the point. It's those three things. For his kingdom, for his will, right here on earth, just like it's in heaven. 
And then he turns to the next three things, which are three things while we're waiting on those three things. Because we're going to pray for those three things. But while we're waiting for those three things, here's three things, Father, that we need. Father, first of all, give us this day our daily bread. This day. Give us this day our daily bread. Now, I know that flies all over you keto people, but God said it. All right, that's good enough. And so carbs are our friend. Grain makes the world go round. And he says, give us this day our daily bread. Our provision comes from God. It doesn't come from us. Now, how many of y'all um, make it rain? Yeah, you don't do that. How many of y'all make uh, the seeds germinate in the ground? No, you don't do that either. You put the seed in the ground, you hope it germinates, but you really don't have anything to do with that process. I mean, you, you can spit on them, you can soak them in water, you can do a lot of things to help, but ultimately, God's the one that gives the increase. It's that miracle that God set up that works itself out. We're just there to witness it and to benefit off of it, but it's God's purpose, God's plan, it's God's invention, it's God's design. We're just there. So, when we look to our daily bread, our provision, where do we look? We look to God. But, Jonathan, how are we going to make it? I don't know. God will make it. But how are we going to do it? I don't know, but God will do it. So, here, he's not saying, Lord, give us seven years of bread. Lord, give us 12 years of bread. Lord, just let us make it to the end of the week on bread. Here, he's saying, Lord, just just today. Just lead me to today. Because if God gave you a 10-year plan, you'd mess it up. And if God gave you a five-year plan, you'd mess it up. And if God gave you a seven-day plan, you'd mess it up. Most of you don't even read your Bible seven days in a row, let alone actually really work out God's plan in your life of, Lord, I want to obey you. I want to glorify you in everything that I have. So he says, no, you just concentrate on today. Today I'm going to honor and glorify God. In this moment, in this breath, I'm going to honor and glorify God. When we dismiss church and when we leave, we're going to honor and glorify God. If we go to the restaurant, we're going to honor and glorify God. When we go to the the gas pump, we're going to honor and glorify God. And whatever is next, Father, you help me honor and glorify you in the next thing. Give us this day our daily bread, but Father, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. The realization that we're trying to be perfect, but we're not perfect. And we're never going to be perfect. So there's going to be transgressions. There's going to be sin. There's going to be, there's going to be debt that's incurred. And we go to God with his grace and with his mercy and we say, Father, forgive us our debts. But Lord, also let me be like you. Let me forgive others their trespasses against me. Because I promise you, no matter how many times you've been sinned against, no matter how many times you've been transgressed, no matter how many times you've been uh, betrayed or you've been gossiped about or slandered, it's nothing compared to the sin debt that you have towards God. You're guilty of much greater sin than you've ever been the victim of. So instead of a victim mentality, Father, you give me a forgiving mentality. That, Lord, I ask for your forgiveness, and, Lord, I want to be just like you as I forgive others. So he says, daily bread, forgiveness. And the next thing is, and do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. The very last thing he asked for is, Lord, while we tarry, while we're waiting on the perfect, while we're waiting on thy will, thy kingdom on earth as it is in heaven, Father, while we're carrying out these days, waiting for the second advent, waiting for the return of our Christ and for perfection to be eternally installed, Father, we ask that you don't lead us into temptation. Father, help us to be faithful. Help us to be men and women of repentance. Help us to be men and women of grace. Help us to be men and women of action. And Father, don't put us through the ringer. Father, don't allow us to tarry down those pathways of sin and rebellion. But Father, always draw us closer. Always bring us back. Father, deliver us where the evil one tries to tempt us. Because the Christian life is a Christian life of temptation. And it has to be a Christian life of repentance so that it can be a Christian life that glorifies God. 
So today, the, the, the things that we see in the, as we begin Matthew chapter 6 is number one, is that we've already seen the tax collector, we've already seen the Pharisees, we've already seen the scribes, and now we meet the hypocrite who does the charitable deed for the wrong purpose and on the wrong purpose. The one that says it's for God, but really it's for self. The one that blows the trumpet and says, look at me. The one that has to get accolades and has to get credit and has to plaque up everything that's ever remotely done, supposedly in the name of God. But it has their name attached to everything. And then when we pray, we don't pray like the hypocrite, where it's a performance and our voice changes and all of a sudden we have this prayer voice and we say that we're praying to God, but we're really praying for ourselves. Prayers don't have to be long. They just have to be heartfelt. They're not repetitive of vain phrases like the heathens do, but rather they're quiet, they're sincere, they're heartfelt, and they're for God and for God alone. And then as we see the the model prayer that's given by Christ to his church, we see the warmth, we see the respect, we see the ultimate goal of the kingdom, the will, and the glory. And then we ask, Father, for daily provision. Father, day by day, be with us. Father, day by day, forgive us. And Father, day by day, draw us closer and closer through repentance. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for today. Lord, we thank you that your word is so rich and full, Father, that it's so timely, Father. Lord, that it it hits us new and distinctly every time we read it. Father, we pray, Lord, that we would learn. Father, that we would advance. Lord, that we would uh, continuously improve as we walk closer and closer by your side, more and more conformed to the image of Christ. Lord, we do pray that you search us, and Father, that anything that is, that is less than, anything that is not God-honoring and God-purposed, Father, that you'd help us to remove it, that we'd be men of repentance, that we'd be men of, 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 of adulation towards you and towards you alone. Father, that every breath, every heartbeat, every prayer, every good deed would be to honor and glorify your name, to lift you up as much, And Father, we do pray for a grand harvest of souls into your kingdom, of new believers coming to know you and coming to serve you, Father, through the impression of your Holy Spirit upon them and their hearts and their lives. But also, Father, as you use us in your ministry to speak your truth in your love to every soul. Lord, we thank you. We praise you, Lord. But most of all today, we love you. We ask this in the name of Jesus, our Christ. Amen. Once you stand.